what happened? All right, so I'm standing in a puddle of sticky epoxy in a garage in my sneakers Ooh. trying to finish rolling it out while the customer standing at the doorway staring at me and I'm slipping and sliding all over the garage <laughs> and the epoxy is curing. I'm sweating bullets. And at that moment I realized that, uh, I'm not going to be doing epoxy anymore and I'm going to stick with, uh, with house painting. <laughs> <laughs> I could see it. I was just hoping you didn't say you slip and fell and are rolling around and <laughs> It was, it was close. So the problem yeah. is, is that I, I wanted, you know, we added epoxy into our, you know, I guess our add ons. It was something that we were hearing off and I was selling it, you know, I was trying to sell it and Sherman Williams was giving me this, you know, the homeowner version of epoxy and it was working and, it, and I'm online seeing these epoxy professionals just like do an amazing job. I'm like, I want to do the best, you know? So I go online and I find this hundred percent solids epoxy and I'm like, okay, I'm going to figure this out. And in the ad they had for it, it's this mom, you know, squeegeeing it. And of course, like she's probably got 10 people like guiding her. But in the video, I'm like, okay, she's doing it. I can do it. And I watched the video a hundred times. They just make it look so easy. So I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go and do this. I had one crew at the time and they're painting houses. I am going to go and do this epoxy job myself. Cause I'm like, this is a great way for me to, I didn't have a bunch of estimates. I'm like, I'm going to make some good money here. I'm going to go and knock out this right. $3,000 epoxy job. So in my brain, I'm thinking I could do this by myself. I didn't have a helper. So I had no one that was there going to, that was going to cut. And I knew that the pot life was 30 minutes. This is just how ignorant I was to this process. I don't know what I was thinking, but <laughs> so I get this kit. I rehearsed it a hundred times in my head, how I'm going to do it. I had the, the ideal client. He was great. Older guy, retiree. This was a two and a half car garage. So we're looking at probably 650 square feet of, of coverage, right? But I'm thinking because I'm squeegeeing it, this is going to just apply like butter. It's, you know, this is fine. So here's the mistake <laughs> I made. I sanded it because that's, I, I did call and ask if I could sand it because I didn't have a grinder. They said, yeah, you can sand it, you know, make sure that you sand the oil spots really hard. It should be fine. I'm like, fine. okay. So I start mixing it. And the night, the night, not the night before, the week before, I ordered some of the spikes that you need to, you know, walk on the epoxy. Yeah. I've never done this before. And I've never seen anyone do this, Steve. But mm -hmm. I bought these spikes because it said I needed them. So I go they in and cool buy too, right? Yeah, they're cool. And I'm thinking that because you look at the videos, you're like, how are they standing on it? But they have these little things on the bottom of their feet, the spikes. So I'm in there and I'm trying to, you know, I, I'm mixing up my epoxy and I'm like getting all excited. I got the headphones in. I'm ready to just go as hard as I can and knock out this job. Like I'm so confident. So I'm in there. I got the pot mix and, and I start cutting around the, the garage floor. OK, so I'm, and as I'm cutting, I'm thinking, man, I'm wasting a lot of time. I only got one side done. And it might have been about seven minutes. Remember, the pot life of this thing is like 30 minutes. And I still got to cut the rest of this. For some reason, it was just dragging on the floor. It was kind of thick. And I'm like, man, I'm trying to lay this thing in. So, so I'm kind of already freaking out a little bit. So anyway, I get through the cutting and it gives me like 10 minutes to squeegee this whole floor. Now I'm starting to kind of panic a little bit, but I'm like, I got this. I got my shoes on. I'm ready to rock. So Steve, I'm squeegeeing this thing. and. I look down and there's a bolt on the floor in my epoxy. And I'm like, what is that little nut? Like picture like a little tiny, like, you know, like nut, like a little screw nut or whatever. I'm like, what the heck is that? And it's coated in epoxy. I'm like, did I not pick that up? Like, is that his that I just didn't sweep or blow? So I'm like, all right, that's weird. So I'm still squeegeeing and, and the guy's checking on me. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, come on out. I want to surprise you. So he goes away. I'm like, I'm, let me just surprise this guy or tell me, you know, he's like, all right, I'll come out. He's like, you okay? Are you doing this by yourself? Oh my God, there's no worse question mm -hmm. you've ever been in that position before. Anyway, so um, I see another bolt on the ground, Steve. I'm like, this is getting weird. Why is, why am I missing all these? <laughs> I'm like, what's going on? And then another bolt and another bolt. And I start picking them up and putting them in my pocket. Mind you, they're full of epoxy. So now I'm starting to make a mess. They're going in my pocket. With epoxy on. And I realized that the shoes that I purchased were just crap. The bolts that are holding in the spike. <laughs> 
were falling <laughs> off of these shoes. So now I'm freaking out because I can't even squeeze my pot life. I got five minutes left. So I'm trying to think, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So I rip off these spikes. Now I'm in my sneakers <laughs> and I'm squeegeeing the floor. And this guy is looking at me like, what is, I'm sweating. I had to like throw yeah. the spikes, like epoxy gun on his driveway. And he had this nice <laughs> rock bed outside. This is a nice neighborhood. Oh, no. And you just see gray epoxy over all these rocks. Cause I had to keep throwing things cause I couldn't step. Right. So yeah, you know that yeah. outside of the garage, you have the, the concrete mm -hmm. and, you would think that I would put paper out there to walk on. Just again, this is my beginning stages of being yep, a contractor yep. <laughs> and uh, long story short, it never cured. So I got it all laid out and I'm thinking, wow, I did it. I think I even threw some flakes. I don't even know what was going on. And uh, it never cured. He called me three weeks later and said, this, this floor is just still tacky and, it, and it's, and it's gummy and uh, it never cured. Three weeks later. Three weeks later. Yeah. And oh he was just, gosh. he was a nice man. He was yeah. very open. And then just to bring this full circle, he, uh, he said, listen, you're, so I would, I went over there, I applied mm -hmm. some, you know, something to strip it. I had my guys over there were scraping gummy epoxy. I mean, we probably got 75% of it up mm -hmm. and then it just wasn't there and you couldn't grind it cause it was still gummy. So he winded up buying floor tiles and he said, look, if you pay for these floor tiles, you know, we'll call it even. And you know, I'll just do floor tile. <laughs> that is my uh, my crazy story. So anytime I hear epoxy, I just like cringe a little bit. <laughs> oh goodness! So I'm with you because we come from near the same area, and we tried epoxy too. I won't get into my stories, but we were we were a hard no on on after a couple of experiences. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It's, they were not in our three P's. So. No, yeah, awesome. that's it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well. Today's guest is from Ocala, Florida. Fun fact, Ocala is where uh, we love to go jeeping in the wildlife uh, management areas up there. It's about two and a half hours north of Venice, right up the uh, the beach line there. He's one of the uh, earliest members and came up through DYB. He owns and operates premium painting as well as the robust CRM estimating platform specific for the painting industry, Drip Jobs. Tanner Mullen, welcome to the show, my friend. Happy to be here. Always been a fan and happy to be a guest. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, <laughs> take us back. That was an awesome story. An awesome origin story there. And we've all got them. Take us back to the beginning. How'd you get into the painting business? Or moreover, what were you doing before you got into the painting business? And why did oh, you choose painting? There's a funny uh, saying I like to say is that the painting, you don't choose the painting business. The painting business chooses <laughs> you, right? I mean, we're all somehow organically uh, introduced to this trade, which is, it's a, it's an amazing trade. And my journey is nothing short of, uh, just chance. And, and again, just being inherited into it. So the origin is, is that my father's stepfather had a painting business. Um, and my father early on, he would work with him, taught him the trade and that became my dad's profession. So in about 2006, we moved to Florida, um, and not the bad part of 2006, the great part of 2006, it was, you know, the economy was incredible. My dad got a job as a supervisor at one of the largest painting companies here, which they're still in business. He was a supervisor for them. They do mostly new construction. So during that time, um, during that time for me, um, I had, you know, seen him, you know, get up and go to work each day. And um, he winded up kind of trying to do his own thing. So he was that guy who was a one man army. And I'm 13 at the time. And he would wake me up six in the morning uh, in the summer. And I would go to work with him. And I loved it because we were working in those retiree neighborhoods. You know, Steve, you oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. probably work for more retirees than anyone in the country. Um, so, you know, we loved working for them. It was really cool. It was just him and me. I would do all the taping um, and I do some rolling. But at 13 years old, it was good money. It was $60 a day. I was able to save up for an Xbox. There you um, go. <laughs> so you know, I really enjoyed it during that time. And, um, but I never thought of it as something that I would do, even though my mom always said, hey, you want to make sure you learn that trade. It's a great trade. She knew what, you know, the opportunity was, but it was still him on his own. And I could see how hard he was working. I was like, man, I'll never want to do this, you know, full time. So I wanted to be a sports agent or one of those flashy, um, you know, uh, careers. And I was in high school thinking about it. And then um, I just worked my way up. I found my way into the restaurant industry. You ever, you ever do any restaurant stuff, Steve? 
when I was 15, I washed dishes for a, um, a Chinese restaurant for three months and I've not fun, uh, fun aside, I've never eaten Asian food since. And I'll just leave <laughs> <it> at that. <laughs> that was my so you know what goes on. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I thought that was my path though. I started off as a bus boy, um, and then worked my way up to a server, uh, as a waiter and then, uh, found my, uh, found an opportunity as an assistant manager of a restaurant, then a general manager at the restaurant by the age of 20. So I'm 20 years old managing, uh, a business. And it was really cool because I really started to understand how business works, just, you know, marketing and sales and customer service. So I had so much experience, um, in that regard, but I started looking at it like, man, like my time is gone. Like I'm getting home at three in the morning, you know, after doing everything, closing out the restaurant and then waking up at two and then having to go in again. And it was just like this cycle that I was just like, Oh, I hate it. So a friend of mine had gotten a job selling cars and uh, he used to come into this restaurant a lot. It was kind of like a kind of like a night scene too, a little bit. It was a really cool place downtown Gainesville, and um, it was really cool because we had a uh, you know we had an opportunity to um, connect with him a lot. And he was sharing how how happy he was selling cars. And I'm like, man, you know, I love sales. I think it'd be really fun for me to do that. Um, and I went ahead and uh, quit my job and applied. And on his recommendation, I got the job working at Toyota. So this was my grand, uh, you know, I would say introduction to sales because the psychology behind what they teach you there is just so interesting, like overcoming objection. Like that is something that for me, unless you actually really experience it um, and see people change their mind in a blink of an eye due to whatever, you know, word track you use or whatever value you build, um, you know, I could see why some don't try to go for objections. They kind of just, you know just take it for face value. But when you're in car sales, you really don't have a choice. They want you to maximize those opportunities. So this was great. I had nine solid months of car sales and it was great. I didn't like what I was doing though. I was taking advantage of people. We were selling things for way too much. There were people, there was an experience. I had a lady brought in a minivan uh, for trade and we were having a competition that month. Whoever can sell a car for way over value, got this big plaque on a wall for everyone to see. So, you know, me being a hungry 21 year old, I'm like, oh, I'm going to do it, you know, and you're just in that environment. And uh, the lady brought in this van and she wanted a better van for her husband who was handicapped. And I believe this was God's way of just showing me like, see what you're doing, right? So she, this was interesting because she needed me to go into the car with her and bring the new car back to her husband back at her house. And I'm like, great, let's do it. You know, again, really just focusing on getting a sale, not really having the, the mindset I do today. And I went back in that car with her and we drove to her house and I saw her house and the conditions they were living in and how hard it was for him to maneuver. And they were just beautiful people and got him in the van and he really liked it. So I'm like, all right, you know, let's get back and, you know, get the paperwork signed. Like, oh, it's just like a terrible car salesman. Anyway, I go back and, you know, we winded up selling this car for like $13,000 more uh, than what it was worth. And for me, I got the plaque on the wall and like people were clapping, like, you know, and it's just this environment. And at that moment I had some time to think and I'm like, this is not for me, you know? And, uh, so prior to that though, my mother had passed away a couple months before and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, thank you. And, and the car sales was a really good way for me to kind of just like focus on work. It was very motivational. I didn't feel stuck. I could had a little more freedom. And, um, during that time, my dad and my sister were home alone. You know, they were, he was struggling. He was a painter. So with his, my mom did all the paperwork. You've heard those stories, right? Oh, yeah. You know, mom oh, yeah. does all the, the phone calls, the paperwork, the, and it, was, it wasn't like top notch, but she was the one who handled all the money. And so when, when she passed away of cancer, he kind of just gave up, right? Completely gave up, threw in the towel, life just, so in the back of my head, I'm, you know, I'm trying to help them out. I'm really the breadwinner of the family. I'm, you know, sending money home and my sister needs things for school. And, you know, I'm just, you know, in a really tough position, but I had to quit that job because it was, the money was not worth my, you know, my character. So thankfully um, I met another friend who uh, sold life insurance. So I'm like, okay, well, this isn't a bad transition, Steve, mm -hmm. right? I can go into life insurance. I can, uh, you know, I'm free as a bird, you know, I don't have to be locked down to a, a place and I feel like I'm helping people. I'm giving them life insurance, right? Wrong. I'm only selling final expense. So essentially I'm going in there pretty much pitching death and saying, Hey, look, you know, <laughs> in Florida, die, in know? Flo context in Florida, <laughs> in Florida. Right. So yeah, they come here for that. And, uh, <laughs> 
I'm over here trying to sell uh, sell them, and and I just I'm like I'm selling fear. Like, I, why can't I just sell something that I love? You know, yeah, yeah. and it's easy to buy. You know, I don't want to do this anymore. So I, I actually set a record in the company. I had no problem selling it. It just again, I really wanted to hit on something that would make me feel pride. You know, I didn't like what I was selling. You know, it, was, it is what it is. So then I got a job uh, working at a local credit union, and this was the pivotal moment for me. It was a great place. I was a loan officer there and I was actually refinancing car loans. So it's funny, I actually refinanced a few loans that I sold uh, at the dealership because it was in the same local area. And uh, the experience I got there, just understanding business, banking, you know, so I'm just getting all this experience that, you know, I'm just like, you know, really just soaking it all up. And there was a guy that came in and he started a painting business. And the idea of starting a business to me at that age, I'm 23, 22, 23 at the time was super foreign. You know, I'm like, oh, man, I got to do all this. All the questions that we get, Steve, you know, mm -hmm. oh, I got a you know, LLC and all this. And, but this guy came in. He didn't know much, but he set up a business bank account. He's like, hey, I'm starting a painting business. And again, God just putting people in my path to help mm -hmm. me like open up my eyes. And I'm thinking, man, like that would be a great idea for me to do to, to help my dad. You know, that's really the only reason why I'm like, I'm making great money here. I'm making 80,000 a year. Uh, I have full health insurance, full benefits. I I'm, I'm in line for a promotion at this bank, but I'm thinking, man, my mom, my, my dad and my sister are at home struggling. I don't know what's going on there. He's developed an addiction. He's really just out of sorts. And I'm thinking, you know, I can't stay here because this isn't helping anyone but myself. And I could just, you know, I could ride off into the sunset and, but I can't leave my family behind. I'm thinking, well, all right, I'll start, a, I'll start a painting business. So did some research, um, <laughs> you know, did some research and, uh, you know, I, I called my dad and I said, Hey, you know, let's, let's give this a try. And, um, wound up quitting my, my cushy, uh, Secure job at, at the credit union. I'm like, hey, I'm young. I, I had no kids at the time. So if there was ever a time to do it, it's now. Wound mm -hmm. up leaving my college town, my one bedroom, awesome apartment. When wound up moving back in with my dad and my sister um, to help them. And that was the foundation of what premium painting is. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's much more that happened along the lines and, and it wasn't as easy as I thought it would have been. But that's the origin story. That's how I got mm -hmm. into this. And, uh, and I fell in love with it. That's awesome. Now, what year was this? Uh, so 2016. 16. Was when, yep. Okay. That was when I quit my job, 2016. Mm -hmm. Yep. 2016. Okay. And we're now celebrating almost seven years in, in business as premium painting. Seven years. Fantastic. Well done. Now, you. describe, uh, you're welcome. Describe uh, what's the business look like currently? Yeah. So numbers wise, we're on pace for 1.4 million. Um, I have 10 employees. Um, we operate on the employee model. So Initially, I started with the independent contractor thing. That didn't last long. Actually, when I stumbled across your um, your stuff, DYB, and I joined in, one of the biggest takeaways was the hiring process. That really, I mean, I attribute almost every one of my hires to your hiring process. Uh, and thank you. it's a matter of just the filtering out was what I was missing. And I think that's what, what changed me from independent contractor to employee was independent contractor was like, hey, do you know someone that paints? <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah. employee is, hey, I'm going to choose. It's almost like I always refer when I talk to people and help people in, in this industry, I say, this is just like dating. Would you just ask someone, hey, do you know someone that's single? You know, yeah, yeah. or do you actually you know, nowadays with online dating, it's very comparable because we're putting out an ad, we're you know beefing up our profile, <laughs> we're getting people excited and then we get responses and we filter through those responses. So. Um, so yeah, so we were an employee based system and you've heard my story. We've been through all sorts of different things right now. We, we, we only do interior and exterior painting. That's it. I will not take anything weird. No outside. <laughs> you know, if it, I, I rarely take wood repair. It yeah. is like, Hey, get a handyman. Let me know when it's done. We'll paint it for you. You know? You so go. that's how the business has grown up into this point. My role in the business has changed due to COVID. So, uh, before COVID I was doing all sorts of estimates. And around that time, I just had a newborn child and my wife was like, you are not going into homes and, you know, risking mm. our kid getting COVID. Yeah. I'm like, oh man, what do we do? So I just transitioned everything to virtual estimating, which was perfect because at that time the customers were happy. They're like, oh yeah. really? You can quote this without having to come over. Cause they were feeling the same way. I'm like, yeah, no problem. So we actually started doing all the estimates virtually. Now, we obviously don't do that anymore because I still feel like you're missing a large 
piece of value by being in the home, but I was able to create an estimator role that I otherwise probably wouldn't have created. And his job is to go there, take all the measurements, take all the pictures, meet the customer, tell them about our company. And then what he does is uploads all that for us and then send the estimate out from the office. So my role is really just estimating from the office, you know, team, you know, uh, management and uh, scheduling at this point. So all the, all the jobs are, are independently ran, which is really helpful. That's awesome. Uh, very cool. And it's interesting too, how these uh, solutions, these opportunities come from constraints. Right? Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Don't ever let a good crisis go to waste. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So where, where does your drive come from? Yeah. Oh man. Ever since I was a kid, you know, just being in poverty, man, just struggling, seeing my parents struggle, seeing them argue, um, not have, there was a time period. I think I was, I was nine years old. We had no money. And my mom was like, well, you know, we know there's a local pizzeria. And I remember her on the phone calling that pizzeria, asking if they can send us a free pizza because we had no money. And there are so many instances like that. Electric getting shut off, me having to go stay at a friend's house, um, just lack of finances early on. And my drive is not to make money. It's to not have to worry about money. You know, yes, so for yeah. me as much and, and, it, and it can be a demise. You know, sometimes I, I have this deep scarcity mindset real deep inside that comes out every now and again, you know, because just my childhood was full of it. I mean, 18, almost 18 years, not being able to go to field trips, not being able to get my hair cut, not being all these things that, you know, a kid goes through and kind of feel like an outcast. My drive is that I never want to experience that again because it was so painful. Um, and I don't want my, of course my kids now, my, now I have kids. It's like that doubled, you know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> not only am I not going to experience it mm -hmm. and my kids aren't going to experience it. Um, and then as of course I got, you know, I've, I'm married and, um, you know, I've been able to really help my wife and, you know, so that's where my drive comes from. It's, yeah. it's, uh, you know, yeah. a little bit of fear based, but also just now it's, now it's transitioning to, uh, to power, which is fun mm -hmm. in a good way, you know, being yeah, able right. to do things that you want to do. Yep, that's awesome. Uh, I can certainly relate. And uh, as far as, you know, coming up that way and not wanting that for ourselves and for our family, uh, sure. it provides a lot of incentive. So there's a quote, um, I forget who said it, but it's, an, it's a baseball quote, something along the lines. I'm going to butcher it here as I try to get it out. You may know it. It says, there are no rich men's kids in the big leagues. <laughs> that's right? very true. Yeah, yeah I love that. They, they don't have the drive for it. They don't have the drive. You've got yeah, to be, yeah. uh, as Les Brown used to say, when you travel, you got to be hungry. You know. Ah oh, man, love less. Yeah, yeah got to be yeah. hungry, man. Got to be and, hungry. <laughs> yeah, that's how he says it too. He would lights out, man, when he was younger. Like he was, you know, if you've listened, I'm sure now that you've referenced him, yeah, he was good. But you know, it, it was. Uh, I was thinking about it yesterday. I'm grateful for it all because I would not have had this drive. This drive is so, and and it's and it's helped me so much. You know, just when I went to work for people. I was going as if I was the business owner. Like I would, I would just, you know, I would work in a way that I would always be recognized for the consistency and the care. And what's great about that is, is that I am now the business owner. So it's almost like I earned that. And I tell my employees that, you know, of course we have employees that want to own their own business one day. And for me, I love when they tell me that. I say, that's great news because guess what? Now I'm going to hold you to the standard as if you are a business owner and you should be treating my business as if you're a business owner within my business. So when it's your turn to own a business, you don't have to rely on learning the traits that you need to be a business owner. You can learn them right here. There you go. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that's the right attitude. That's what being a cooperative capitalist is all about because there's, uh, you know, scarcity could come in and say, oh, no, you're fired. You're not going to become my competition. Right. Um, but no, that's that's the right uh, mindset. And even when they do go out, what I found and uh, maybe you already have is uh, they go out there and they just say, you know what? It's just not worth all that. I'd rather, you know, would you have me back? And when they I've, come back, they are the absolute best, best. needs. Yeah. I, yeah. And I've, I've had people that have to just see what it's like, you know, and they have a different respect for. Uh, you know, even, even guys that haven't done that with me, there's guys that have tried it and they come in and are like, yeah, I've, yeah, I'm not going to be doing that again. And some yeah, people want it. Yeah. Some people don't. I tell my guys, look, the benefit of being an employee is you get to shut off at five o'clock. You know, <laughs> I don't have a don't. show. We're always, we're always on. <laughs> Wake up in the middle yeah. night, use the bathroom. We're thinking. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> What's a paradigm shift. So as, as you got started, 
and uh, still here with the painting company and, and you're building the painting company. What were some paradigm shifts for you along the way? Well, the biggest paradigm shift was, you know, I had to get out of the way. You know, that was one, you know, early on in my business, I didn't know anything about creating a business and not painting. You know, that wasn't the mindset. It was, hey, I'm going to go paint and make some money, yeah. you know. Um, so that was the biggest one. And that's the first one is just really understanding that my first responsibility is to optimize a team, you know, and get it, getting people to do things that I think that I have to do. And that's as simple as I can put it. You know, in other words, something as simple as picking up the paint in the morning. When I delegated that to someone, I've never, I haven't picked up paint in five years, you know, or six years. And I only do it if I'm in the area and they need a gallon and I'm coming to the job anyway, you know, but something as simple as that. So delegating and uh, uh, that would be the first one is, you know, learning how to delegate responsibility. Would there be interactions early on in my business I'd have with customers and I'd say, hey, Colton is actually the project manager. You know, I would just like let him hear that, make that known to the customer. And then anyone around him would know he's the project manager. Ask him, even though I knew the answer, even to the customer, even not, you know. So having that discipline early on was big. But then the, the second paradigm shift, which I am very good at now, which I was not good at, was getting the wrong people out and and separating emotion. I love people. I care about people. I brought you into this world. So most of this is my fault anyway. But because of the fact that you're not meeting our standard and you're not aligned with, you know, where we're trying to go, I have to let you go. And that was not easy. I would keep people around so long just because two reasons. It was comfortable mm -hmm. and I had too much too much so my friend to boss ratio was out of out of whack. Mm -hmm. And I learned that in the restaurant industry because as a manager in the restaurant industry, everyone wants to go hang out and you become this friend. And I'm like, man, I can't really discipline you if we just hung out, you know, like yeah, yeah. it's really weird. Right. <laughs> and then, you know, you won't invite me out the next time. It was such a weird dynamic. So now that's another thing in my business. Like I love my guys, but it's very rare that we spend any time outside of work unless it's company organized or like something cool like that. And that's just to number one, create a good, healthy balance and I'm not saying we can't, you know, just there's just certain thing that I have, you know, and I just want to make sure that it remains professional because I look at my guys. Sometimes I'm like, any one of you guys could be the next one that I have to make a tough decision about if you don't, you know, keep the standard high, you know, because one person's downfall could mean a bad, you know, review or, you know, or jobs get behind. So that, that was the big paradigm shift for me is just separating friendship and business and making tough decisions when it comes to hiring and firing. So Great point. What would you say, uh, what part does culture play for you in your business? Culture is like the most important thing. I have great relationships with all of my guys. Great. You know, and I, one thing I do every time I go to a job is I pull each one of them aside, stand outside, just have a conversation just about what's going on. How do they like working here? How, do, how are they happy? You know, what's been going on? If they want to talk about their personal problems, you know, I, I'm, I'm always there to listen. What are, you know, I just try to be a, be there, you know, um, as a, as a leader, you know, um, for them. And that helps with culture, but also managing workflow, not putting them in positions that I wouldn't want to be put in, not forcing work on the weekends, not forcing work, uh, after hours, um, because of my inability to schedule things properly. Um, just really putting myself in their shoes. And I think they all appreciate that because, uh, you know, maybe they haven't had it in the few, in, in the past, but the expectation in return is, is that while we're working, we're optimizing um, and that, you know, we're, we're being, you know, contributing in a, in a positive way. I also started doing performance reviews. Um, I just did, I think I've done four out of uh, the, the 10 uh, and that was eye opening for me. This is my first round doing it like actual official performance reviews. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned a lot, you know, so again, that helps with culture, just them having a checkpoint. And I think, Without those performance reviews, I could see how it's a sense of aimlessness. Like, well, wh where am I in the business? How have I done? And I think we all want to hear that we're doing a good job. Like after this podcast, I want you to say, Tanner, hey, that was a good podcast. Good job. Right. Like that's the craving we have. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, yeah. You want to hear, hey, you know, like that was a great interview, Steve. Like, you know, we all want that <laughs> sense of like, hey, we did a good job in all that we do. Um, so I try to always make sure that I emphasize that, hey, you guys did a great job. I share good reviews with them. Um, I probably say thank you more than anyone in the world. That is another thing that, that happens. Like you can never say thank you too much. It's like the cheapest form of currency. 
and I overuse it like you wouldn't believe. I am I withdraw overdraft my thank you account big time. Can't um, out thank you. Out. <laughs> 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 yeah, just, you know, so and hey. Hey, can you go pick that up? Thank you. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, you know that's kind of how I've done it. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but it's worked for me. I have guys that've been with me for years. They treat. If you look at our reviews, the the reviews say the crew, the crew, the crew, the crew, the team, the team, the team, the team. And it's like what I've found is that through that, um, you know, I would say through that energy that I give them, it translates directly to the customers. Right on. What are some books that have made an impact on you? Two books that come to mind. Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad was mm. actually, I read that in the car dealership. Um, yeah. I was waiting for people to walk in, which very rarely happened now that most people buy cars online. Mm. Uh, so I had plenty of time to read that. That was, that was pivotal. A couple of takeaways from that were just understanding um, financial freedom. You know, mm. that was important. Just understanding the difference between, you know, working for a dollar and letting a dollar work for you. Um, and then the e-myth was good as well, which I'm sure you've read. Um, for me, the e-myth was, uh, you know, just, just an eye opener. You got the girl in the pie shop, you know, and, uh, the story and just saying, Hey, and you she know what? Sad and she reached for my hand and yeah, I'm like, yeah. come on, Michael, let's get to the, <laughs> you it, Michael. no, it was, uh, you know, the technician mentality was like, Hey, you cannot run a business that way. So he hit on a really solid topic. Another one was the compound effect. Now that's not so much business, but the compound effect was really good for me to help me see the micro, uh, you know, the micro actions and decisions that add up. And I still try to apply some of those things in my life today, even though I've read that book five years ago. Those are the three that right off the bat um, stick out to me the most. Fantastic. Excellent books too. If anybody listening or watching has not uh, read or listened to those, highly recommend. Yeah. All right. Here's the fun question. It's going to be natural lead into... Uh, the next business, what does your tech stack look like? Tech stack. Oh man. So my tech stack has changed probably more than anyone's. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that there's, there's tech for, you know, each area of your business. The first one is gusto. That was big for me. Um, I would have paychecks or I'd have ADP and I'm sure they've adjusted to this model, but gusto was really cool because it's all self-serve. So I can run 10 payrolls if I want. I can go in and fix whatever I want. I could do whatever I want. Creates a nice portal for my customer, not my customers, my employees. They can log in, see all their stuff. It's super, the onboarding's easy. So I love Gusto for payroll. There's no better option in my opinion. And it's really cost effective. So that's for payroll. For background checks, I use clear checks. Really good, really good uh, software for that. Photo sharing. I love company cam besides drip jobs. Company Cam is my favorite app. It's awesome. Organizes all the photos, checklists, really solid app. I, you know, talk with the CEO and he's got a really great vision for what he's building over there. And Drip Jobs uh, integrates with it really well. Um, right now we're using GroupMe uh, for, for texting um, or, or, you know, group chat, pretty easy group chat. Um, and then, uh, of course, Drip Jobs. So Drip Jobs. Uh, handles pretty much everything, proposals, invoices, appointment scheduling, job scheduling, um, automatic follow-ups, texting, you know, um, the whole, the whole nine. So that's kind of like the, the home base and then everything else branches out from there. Okay. Right on. So let's, uh, thank you. Let's go ahead and dive into trip jobs a little bit. First, how did that come about? Yeah. So actually I was really, um, interested in optimizing my workflow. So in every job that I had, I always had some, some form of CRM, you know, and I, of course, naturally I wanted to find one for the painting business and I couldn't find one. So I'm doing everything on spreadsheets and I'm, I'm at, you know, early on I'm buying leads, you know, and I know that we don't talk about that every now and again, but I need, <laughs> I had no other option. I didn't have yeah. DYB. I had yeah. to figure it out. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm buying leads and I'm learning that, man, like I'm losing track of these leads. There's people that didn't answer the phone. There's people that did answer the phone. There's people that told me they weren't ready yet. And there's people that say, call them back in three days. Right. And I'm starting to get or disorganized and I'm thinking, mm -hmm. okay, well, how do I figure this out? So one of the things I did was, of course, I put them all in a spreadsheet and I'm like, cool, I got them all organized in a spreadsheet. And I'm going to add this little column with a checkbox that says contacted and another one that says said follow up. And I think, I think I'm a genius. I'm sharing it with my little network. I'm like, guys, I created this perfect spreadsheet. And then I'm starting to think, well, I probably should send them a text message in an email. So, you know, I get the text message and I type it up and I copy and paste it and send it. And I get the email, I copy and paste it and send it. No response. Okay, well, 
let me maybe send another one. So the next day I'd say, oh, I got to send all my texts and emails. So I'd send another one, send another one, trying to get this appointment booked. And I'm thinking, oh, I hate leads. You know, this is horrible. <laughs> you know, this is why you need BYB. So you'll have to chase these people down. Anyway, so um, as time went on, I kind of optimized the system and I used Active Campaign. I used You Can Book Me. I used Zapier. I used um, Slick Text. I used Google Calendar. I used. Um, so that was five. Oh, proposal builder. I think I was using estimate rocket at the time, mm -hmm. uh, or Joist, one of those two. And I was using, um, Stripe or square for payments. So that's nine apps. There's probably two more. Oh, yeah. And what I'm doing was, is I was combining them all and tying them into Zapier, which is probably the greatest app of all time. I think mm. Zapier is probably honestly the greatest invention for apps ever. It just connects everyone. Amazing. Mm -hmm. You should see that. I looked up their valuation the other day. It was like, oh, yeah? like what is uh, it? I don't know. It's like 50 billion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like insane. Anyway. So, so anyway, so I'm, so I'm like, oh my God, I, again, I think I just like, like discovered fire because what I did was, is I found out that uh, home advisor at the time had an open API and you can zap in the lead to whatever you want. So I would zap in the lead to active campaign and inside of active campaign, I created a follow-up sequence, text and email. And then from there I was like, Oh my God, this is great. Let me zap it over to estimate rocket and get that customer's information in estimate rocket. And then let me zap it over to the calendar. So I created this system and I called it trade thrive. And it was just all of these things together, similar to probably what you guys do on the DYB virtual side. But mine was kind of like a package called Trade Thrive that we would just, I would reach out to my friends and then some of the people that I was helping out and I would set it up for them. And people loved it because it's like, oh, wow, I don't have to type in information eight times. Mm -hmm. Because of that, I knew that there was a need for something custom, right? So during COVID, I was on Instagram and I'm just looking for some reason I was looking at my followers just one random day and I see this company. It's like a software development company. I'm like, Hey, this is cool. Let me go check out what they have. And they had actually an invoicing and I think they had like a, a project management app for trades. Mm -hmm. So my thought was, okay, I'm looking for something better than what I have. Maybe I can white label what they have and just tie it into my automations. I'm like, this would be even better because it has like some scheduling and it's kind of designed for contractors. So I reached out to them on a phone call, said, Hey, I do this. I would love to see if I can white label your software. They're like, all right, well, let's get together on a call. And I get on a call. I'm like, okay, but can we do this? And can we do this? And go them. I'm all excited. I'm like, like Tanner, no, that's a custom software. We can build you that, but you know, you're going to have to pay for it. So this is right in the middle of COVID. I don't even know if my painting business is going to survive, but when you have a vision and no one can stop you, I'm like, I know this is going to work. I, like people need this. Like this is going to change the the landscape of, you know, painting businesses forever, you know? And, uh, so I invested way too much money and, uh, um, that was with the, my wife's blessing. It's more money than I've ever spent in my life on anything, uh, to get this thing going. I knew nothing about software. I knew no, I, in retrospect, I didn't even know what I was getting, I just knew that, hey, I gave them a wireframe. I gave them with the, I gave them a 50 page document. I spent three nights typing up everything I wanted. And I said, this is what I want. They gave me a price for it. So that's how Drip Jobs was born, um, which is a custom software top to bottom. There's nothing uh, spent, spun off about it. And at this time, to give some context full circle, um, we have eight full time employees. We have five full time developers. We have a customer success uh, representative, uh, support. We have a account executive who handles all the sales and demos. And we have a sales development representative who does outbound calling all day. Um, and it's, uh, it's really taking off. It's a, it's a great program. That is awesome. That is really cool. Well, well done indeed. You, and, man. uh, you gave April and I a tour, uh, what a week or two ago, and we were really impressed. I'm yeah. really impressed with what you've done. The, uh, some, you know, features that stand out are the, that it's a pipe driven CRM, uh, but the other side of that, and this is something that's lacking in most CRM, is the uh, revenue source reports and lead source reports by revenue. So important, right? So important. <laughs> if you don't know where you're making your money, how, how, what do you you know? How, what do you know to double down on? And what exactly. do you know to cut loose? Yeah, and you yeah, need no. a full circle software to be able to perform that. You need to know where the, and that's why we require lead source on everything. Like at the very least, they'll pick something, but most people we find choose it because I'll double back every now and again and say, you know, if I meet them, how'd you hear about us? And I just cop, I'm just check, make sure they pick the right one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah, it, it's so important. If you don't yeah. have something that takes in the lead and then invoices at the end to, to capture that, that dollar amount, 
And uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Very important metric. Mm -hmm. April and I had, uh, you know, we've got a running joke story back in the days, you know, when she first came on and we were still, we were, you know, trying to make our way out of startup season and she'd get excited about a new lead that call in. She'd call me and I'd be on the road or whatever. And I'd, I'd have to interrupt her. I'm like, source, what's the source? Where they source. Come from? Yeah. <laughs> source. yeah, I love that. You know, and so she jokes around. She's like, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's rotary or whatever it might be. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. yeah. yeah. Great news. All right, yeah. now, now give me the rest of the information. No, but <laughs> nothing's more exciting than knowing that, like, for example, I did an ad in uh, this retirement company, or retirement mm -hmm. community. And one of the cool things I did, and I don't know um, if you've ever done this. You ever take out an ad in a retirement community, one of their books? Like, you ever do that? No. no. Mm -hmm. So so I look through their books, Steve, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at it. It's like they have all the fun stuff in the first half of the book. And on the second half of the book, it's just ads. It's just like yeah. it's just yeah. ads. So you know what? I'm like, I'm going to take a full page ad out. But on half of the page, these are retirees. I'm going to put a crossword puzzle. So yeah. it gives them something. That they <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So on the bottom half of the page was a crossword puzzle. And at the top, it was my ad. And we've generated $20,000 so far. And that ad started in April. And again, source, you know, and it's like, I got you from the booklet. And I, I'm like, it's got to be the crossword puzzle. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Because I looked at it and I'm like, if I'm an older person, you know, and they love doing those things still, you know, and I'm like, so I looked online, I looked up crossword puzzle generator and it was like parts of your house. You know? <laughs> and uh, that was it. So. Oh my goodness. And so they're on that thing for like an hour or so. I don't know how large it is. And but then they look up and they see yeah. a picture of eight guys in uniforms. Yeah. Hey, you need your house painted? Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, that's brilliant. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Uh, well done indeed. Walk us through real quick uh, uh, Drip Drive. So go ahead and give us like, um, yeah, go ahead and give us an overview if you would, just so, I mean, we've talked yeah. about it. But Ele Elevator pitch would be simple. You have leads and customers. It's not just for leads. You know, these are for your customers too. Leads is just really like one, if I had to break it down in tenths, the lead nurturing is just like one tenth of what it does. Um, that's just one stage. So in your business, you have 11 stages and that's an understatement. I have people that add stages, but naturally there's 11 stages that a customer will go through if they decide to buy with you. 10, if it, let's say 10. First one is a cold lead. So let's say that comes in from a lead source and it doesn't have to be Angie or Home Advisor or Thumbtack. This could be uh, Google or Facebook, right? Maybe you have a landing page and they go in, they put in their name, their email and a phone number, right? That's a cold lead. You have to reach out to them. Um, so what's cool is initially that Drip Jobs will send a text message in an email, It'll say, hey, we've got your request. Please click here. So there's an internal booking form that they can fill out once you know they get that text message. Now, if they don't fill that form out, they're still in the cold lead stage, Steve. So that means that Drip Jobs knows, hey, we need to keep sending them follow-ups because they're still in that stage. Well, when they do fill it out, it moves the customer to a new stage automatically and stops the old follow-ups. So the customer always gets automatic communication relating to where they are in the buying process. There's never the wrong communication going out. And not, and that's what makes us different is not only do we give the software with all the follow-ups built in, we, we give it with the automate, the pipeline automation built in because we know what contractors need. So you have your cold leads and then you have warm leads, right? So if you get a lead, uh, let's say from Rotary and they say, Hey, you know what, Steve, I just wanted to say, hello, we're not moving in until, I don't know, next July. Right. And then, well, you know, that's great, Joanne. Hello, but you know, uh, well, what we're going to do is put that customer in warm leads, which is a long term follow up sequence, right? So it might go out for nine months every month. Hey, it's Steve, you know, touch and base. Did you have any questions about the project? Are we still on schedule uh, for us to come out, you know, later down the line? By the way, if you're ready to proceed, here's a link, right? So we know in warm leads, that's a long term follow up. Next is estimate requested. These are the good customers. These are the ones that go right to the website. These are the ones that call in. These are the ones that are ready for an estimate. We send them a link or we put them in manually in estimate requested and it, re and it creates an estimate request in the system. Then we have estimate scheduled. That's when they're on the schedule. We have in draft. That's when we're building their proposal but haven't sent it yet. We have proposal sent. That's when we send the proposal. So all of us as contractors, we send all sorts of proposals. I guarantee you up to any contract, you say, hey, real quick, name me the last five people you gave a proposal to. They would not be able to do it. And then they have to go to a software, scroll down the list. Ours is easy. It's visual. Proposal sent up oh, one, two, three, four, five right there. 
So if they're in that stage, remember, they're getting follow-ups. Hey, are you ready to move forward? Hey, have you thought about financing? Hey, here's our last before and after. Hey, and it's just nurturing customers. And at the very least, we're getting responses. Whether they go with us or not, we're getting responses. So that's your sales pipeline, right? Then you have your jobs pipeline, which many people forget, right? So some people will think that Drip Jobs just, you know, does, uh, you know, marketing and sales, but you can drip out production based communication, Steve. So for example, I have someone that, um, so once the, once the project is accepted, they put down their deposit, it moves to the jobs pipeline, a follow-up sends out right away. It says, Hey, thanks so much for going with us. Now that you've you know proceeded to move forward, here's our checklist for you to prepare for your interior project. And then next is when you schedule it, Hey, we need colors. Please submit your colors with this form, right? And when it's in project in progress, hey, 24 hours later, hey, just touch a base. Are you happy with the progress so far, right? So you can really get creative with how you communicate um, with the customer in these stages. And that's the, that's the gist of it. And then it ties into all the things that you would expect, invoices, proposals, work orders, uh, change orders, all the things that you need to, to create a good experience for your customer. Yeah, so to estimating to the uh, the CRM production reporting. rate estimating. Yeah. Yep. So we actually, yep. as of right now, I just got the final review. So we are uh, prepared to launch that within two weeks. So we'll have hey, a full. Hey. You know, I know that's been that was been fun. Um, yeah. uh, production <laughs> rate estimating inside of there, which is one hundred percent necessary. It should be the industry standard. I just don't mm -hmm. think anyone's made it easy enough um, okay. to do. That's my personal opinion on it mm -hmm. in terms of just speed, efficiency, mm -hmm. you know, um, oh, yeah. and flexibility because. Yeah. Every job is different. I had someone come to me and say, Tanner, there's software that I'm using, but um, there it doesn't allow me to change the spread rate on a per substrate basis. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense because if we go on stucco, you know, that's we're going to use you know more paint than if we were painting a flat wall. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just things like that. So we try to take all the feedback and create something really easy. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you very much. We'll post a uh, link to uh, Drip Jobs uh, in, the, in the show notes. Or on YouTube in the uh, description, and there's you an extended. A, uh, you paint a little stucco, right? A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think you know. I still wake up in the middle of the night painting stucco. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you spray uh, stucco we, or did you did you roll? We rolled eighteen inch uh, uh, nice. eighteen inch rollers. We were you know uh, either the uh, well you know always let the let them decide. I never really care it as long as they, you know, hit, hit times within sure. our standards. Yeah. I'm the same. Um, but we didn't spray. We, uh, we cut and rolled and, uh, we use that as a, a selling point as well. Yeah. And, it is a uh, selling point. There's a lot mm, of customers that have some apprehension about spraying. A lot. Yeah. So it helps. Uh, it's it's another, it's another key to sell to close them. Yeah. Um, so we'll leave uh, a link to drip jobs in there and there's an extended uh, trial period with this link. So, uh, if you're interested, I mean, you can go straight to the website. You're welcome to. But if you use this link, you get an extended uh, trial period. And then Tanner will also, or somebody on his team, will give you a uh, free demo. Now, heads up on the demo is there's a $50 deposit, but it's refundable if you show up, which is smart. So, yes. uh, you know, I was <laughs> thinking about that with my strategy calls. Yeah. I'm like, how should yeah. you charge me <laughs> you can't all you know, No, it's been up. super helpful. I mean, mm -hmm. and I, we call that an onboarding. So we'll happily do a demo for free. You can oh, go okay, on great. and we'll do a demo for free. That's no problem. We don't mind doing that. But the onboardings are more in depth. We go in, we help you set up your account. And just to be clear, Steve and DYB are the only people in the whole world getting a 75 day trial for his clients and anyone listening. So through Steve's link, you get 75 days. You get you can transform your business with Drip Jobs for free uh, in 75 days. So that's absolutely free. Just mention DYB when you come in and we'll help you out. Awesome. Appreciate that, Tanner. Thank you. Sure. Now, uh, before we roll out, is there a question I should have asked or any final points you'd like to make? Yeah. You know, I, I think um, I, I really love, you know, what you represent in the industry. I, I'm, to be honest with you, I'm excited to see you at Expo. And and I know that, uh, you know, you're going to be putting out some more content in our massive painting contractor community. Um, you know, to be honest, I think uh, you've, you've hit, hit a lot of cool things. I'm grateful to be able to tell my story. And, you know, my mission is to, you know, impact the lives of contractors and business owners through, through the vehicle of software. I'm a software nerd. Uh, I love, I love, uh, streamlining processes and making things easier and growing, growing a, a painting business at the same time is really rewarding, you know, to be able to, 
take my own medicine, use it when I'm uh, out there, and then also get frustrated at myself when something doesn't work, <laughs> and then and then write an immediate message to the team. We got to fix this. Yeah, uh, so yeah. yeah, you know, just just being part of the community, and I just want to thank you for having me, man. It's been it's been cool to be a part of this. Fantastic, thank you, and uh, I can sincerely sincerely tell you, this has been a fun, an awesome interview, a lot of fun. Great job. Thank <laughs> you. Great job. Yeah. <laughs> well done. I was waiting for that. Thank you, Steve. Great uh, job. This, Great this one's going to be a hit. There's no doubt. I'll, I'll, uh, we'll look back on the stats. Somebody's, I know they're going to laugh at my epoxy story. That's, <laughs> That's 100% awesome. true. It is, <laughs> well, I probably have a picture somewhere I might give to Steve so you can add it to the, the show That's notes. That's awesome. <laughs> I could just see your shoes melting. You're pulling them off. Your socks sticking. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. We've been there. I get it. So yeah, That's why. So, I, I how you learn a lesson the hard way is to <laughs> yeah. stick with what you're if you take anything just do what you're good yeah. at yes yeah, stick to your three p's good. right yep that's, that's right well uh, if somebody would like to uh, contact you what's the best way they should reach out um you can find me on instagram at contract coach um or you could just go to dripjobs.com and you know if you really need to get a hold of me you probably go through the help desk yeah. <laughs> that's the quickest place i'll respond you know so okay. just Fair just enough. get to us there okay awesome well tanner thank you again appreciate it a lot of fun my uh, pleasure, man. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great day. You too.